Okay, so uh, we we're gonna talk about switching addictions. And uh, I don't know if y'all research much about the disease of addiction and where uh, the um, addiction field is going or the eating disorder field is going. But there's a lot of stuff out there that, uh, I mean, it just amazes me how, you know, so many professionals and treatment centers are putting down the 12 steps. They're saying they're antiquated, that they're not, uh, they don't apply to today, the blah, 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 blah. And some of the information that they put out uh, makes me know, absolutely know, 1,000% that they don't really know what they're talking about. They haven't read the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. Uh, and uh, anyway, so I make up that it is uh, non-recovering professionals who are putting out, you know, this uh, you know, what they're saying, there's a whole movement about that addicts and alcoholics can drink successfully. I don't know if any of y'all have heard about all of this stuff. Maybe I don't need to be telling you. If you haven't heard it, I won't tell you. <laughs> but anyway, uh, this still, as sad as it is, as much information as there is out there, you know, when I started in this business over 40 years ago, no one wanted to be in the addiction field. There was no money for it. Uh, insurance companies across the board would not pay for addiction, uh, alcoholism, drug addiction. Uh, the few treatment centers that we had, now we had, there was some good treatment centers, but basically uh, they were nonprofit, you know, uh, supported by the state or whatever. And uh, so we, you know, those of us in Texas, and I mean, I played just a small role in that, but I went to all, I went to, Austin many times, but we really fought to get insurance companies to pay for alcoholism and drug addiction. And today in the state of Texas, if there is an insurance company, they must pay for addictions, alcoholism, just like they would any other disease. I'm just saying that to say that there have been, there have been some good movements in the addiction field. And still, we're so far behind. Uh, and, and uh, you know, I have my own thoughts about switching addictions because I have, like I said, I've been in the field a long time. I've been in recovery, uh, you know, started in Al-Anon in October of 1968 and then Overeaters Anonymous in 72 and got really good in recovery in 85 for my eating disorder after going to treatment. So I've been around a lot of the disease and a lot uh, of recovery. And I have seen people recover, I have. And I see some sitting right here on this screen that people have long-term recovery. Uh, and I'm glad to see y'all because the research that I've been looking at has not been very uh, uplifting. But I will say, and I don't know where they get their statistics in AA because it is an anonymous program, but I don't know who they got to talk about it. But anyway, they're still saying, but in AA, <clears throat> the uh, recovery rate is about 10 to 12 percent, uh, which is very low. And uh, but you know, if they would go by, I mean, keep going and look at people in long term. Anyway, there are some long term people in recovery. But what I've been seeing, uh, which is encouraging, is that people who couple going to treatment with also. Uh, in incorporating the 12 step program in their aftercare life forever and always, amen, that ratio, that number goes up to 46% for people who have gone to treatment and also uh, participate in a 12 step program. So that's good news to me. One of the things that we've seen, and I've done it myself, is that getting into uh, addiction from the primary, I mean, getting into recovery from the primary addiction. What I've seen in myself and with other people is that it leaves a large gapping hole <laughs> in our soul. I mean, it's like a vacant building in there that you don't have anything to put in there to change the way you feel. 
you know, in the early 80s, we began hearing, and I believe it, that there's not only substance abuse, but there's process addictions. Uh, and a lot of people in the field poo-poo that, but anyway, they really haven't worked with people, I don't think, that have process addictions. But it's anything that we can reach outside ourselves to bring inside ourselves to change the way we feel. So the bottom line, and I did see this in many uh, of the, a lot of the research that I've done, thank God, uh, I've, I saw the word feelings pick, uh, uh, stand out many times. We've always said here at Shades that addictions are diseases of the feelings. Feelings are not facts. Feelings will not kill us. Sometimes when we're feeling those feelings, we think we're not going to live through it, but not addressing them will kill us from some form of stress-related illness or from getting back into our primary addiction or this comes into the play of switching addiction. It's like finding anything that can make us feel better about ourselves. So when we see people <clears throat> come back where they've either relapsed in their, uh, in their primary addiction, and this is across the board all, I mean, before I ever came here or when I was at the Serenity House, when we'd see people keep coming back, coming back, coming back, which is good. You know, if they relapse, that's the thing to do is get back wherever that takes into recovery, <clears throat> whether that's going back to treatment or whatever. Uh, because the disease never gives up. It never gives up. It is always there. And this is another thing that we're hearing in this new uh, addiction. You know, like I said, no one wanted to be in the field years ago because it didn't pay anything at all, uh, a little bit from the state. Uh, now, insurance pays like a slot machine, particularly for any addiction, alcoholism, drug addiction. Uh, they better pay in the state of Texas or they are setting themselves up for a lawsuit. But nevertheless, the addiction field has grown to be a billion dollar business. Think of it, a billion dollar business. People make lots of money off of people, folks like us. I will tell you. And Shades of Hope was never designed to make lots of money. Uh, or to, I mean, we, it was designed to keep the doors open uh, because it was a mission and a passion. And I'm not saying I'm the only one in the United States or in the world that has a treatment center that was open. The work started with the passion. Uh, a lot of treatment centers, that are ones that have been around for a long time, and most of them have been sold out to corporations or whatever. Nevertheless, Addiction is big business, and and it is a very complicated problem. <laughs> it is that there's a simple solution. Uh, that that's the that's the baffling part of addiction. It is a complicated problem. You know, it affects us physically and it affects us mentally and emotionally. And physically, uh, that is the easiest part to address, as hard it is, as it is. It's hard to lay down that first drink, it, I mean that last drink. It's hard to stay away from drugs and alcohol. It is hard to stay away from the food or the love or the sex, whatever your primary addiction is, to just stop it <laughs> uh, has been proven to not be that successful. Because what we say when people stop an addiction, if they don't treat the underlying causes and conditions, that core pain, and sometimes that core pain, a lot of addicts, and I'm looking at some here, and I can include myself in this, you know, some of us have had horrendous things happen to, to us in childhood. Those core issues must be addressed. And also many addicts of every sort suffer from anxiety, depression, mental health diagnoses. So those must be addressed and they cannot be addressed in Alcoholics Anonymous. Alcoholics Anonymous is designed for one thing and one thing only, and that is to help alcoholics get sober. OA is for Overeaters Anonymous. You go down the list of all of the uh, 12-step programs. They're single-focused, 
and that's how it should be because when you go in and they've kept AA pure, and I'm glad of that, because when you go into an AA, and you think you're going into an AA meeting and you hear them talking about other things, you think you've, you know, you've walked into the, right, to the wrong room. 12-step programs are very effective if they are, uh, if people follow directions and do what's taught, you know. Uh, I've seen many people and a lot of you are using the 12-step program and it works. But what happens when people get in recovery, if they don't have a very good recovery program, when the feelings come up and the th problems come up, you know, boy, they are, you know, hell bent on not breaking their abstinence or, you know, drinking or drugging, but they can switch over to another addiction. Uh, many of your alcoholics switched to work addiction. I've seen it over and over and over again. They'll get out of treatment. You know, the Serenity House, I mean, we'd be doing good if we could get them going to 90 meetings in 90 days. Most of the time, if you can get them 90 meetings in 90 days, you're, they're on the road, for their, regardless of the 12th step, I mean, regardless of what 12 step program it is, because it begins to change their brain chemistry. And I believe, and I'll believe to the day I die, unless proven different, that addictions are about the brain chemistry. Our brains as addicts don't quite <laughs> Uh, respond as well as those of a normal brain because a non-addict I have friends I've got old friends sitting right here her name is Misty and you know we all have problems when she has a problem I have never to this day and I've been with her lots of days for eight years I have never seen her reach out for a drink smoke a cigarette binge and purge, starve herself, work herself. Now, if she, if she's a hard worker. If she had an addiction, it'd probably be kind of maybe in the, the work side. But she's what we call a normie. And I love to surround myself with some normies to give me a frame of reference of what that might look like. And I don't know about you, but I know my brain as an addict is different from normal people because I don't see normies reaching out for a substance to ease the pain of living. And then I hear people all the time saying, well, aren't we all addicted to something? No, they're not. Not everyone's addicted to something. Now you might use different things to use uh, to ease the pain of living, but someone that's not an addict will get tired of doing it and they'll quit doing it. Addicts, we hang in there uh, like a bulldog. I mean, because it changes the way our brains feel and how we feel on the inside. It calms us down, it gives us energy, it gives us, you know, feelings of self-worth. And when we aren't using a substance, all of those things that we used over in the first place resurface. And so, like I said, that is when, uh, you know, like there's a variety of factors that play into that, like what I said. Uh, you know, we use a substance to relieve anxiety, to relieve depression, pain of any kind, stress. You know, we use a substance because it works for those of us that are addicts. We're not a bunch of idiots. If it didn't work, we'd give it up. We'd do it a couple of times and think, oh, well, I don't do that anymore. Or we'd forget to do it. Addicts don't forget to use. That's one thing we do not forget to use when we're in an addiction. And that's why we, I believe staying uh, honest, and I'm gonna talk about honesty next week, but it's uh, about staying honest with other people in the program. And this is where, you know, you don't, we don't have to get honest and tell everything to everybody we meet, but we need to have at least one, maybe two very safe people that know everything about us and love us anyway, 
that they can tell when we're either withholding information, which is lying by omission, or we're just flat out lying to them. They know us because they are us. If they're an addict, they know how an addict operates. You can't get by with stuff with a sponsor because they've done what you've done. And they know the games that we play, particularly early in sobriety or abstinence. So, you know, it, addiction of any sort is set up to make us feel better. And so when we get in recovery from our primary, like I said, when those feelings, when that those, that pain of the past comes up that's not resolved, <clears throat> you know, we'll switch to work, we'll switch over to food, we'll switch. And I'll tell you, and I hate this about AA. I, I, I don't hate it, but I, it bothers me about AA. I don't know how much they have learned, if anything, about food addiction or using food to ease the pain. You can still go into the rooms and, you know, they'll have baskets of candy there or whatever you know and if you if you get to crying or something one of them say here honey have a stickers bar or have this or have that and they do that out of ignorance but look around that table and see how many of them have used food in their sobriety you know and i've said this before we have had some really good recovering uh powerful recovering aas and uh, drug addicts that have died of diabetes caused from, you know, uh, st stage two diabetes caused from obesity that didn't occur until they recovered from drugs and alcohol. That's the sad part about it. So food is really the number one for drugs, drug addicts and alcoholics. For your, uh, and for your eating disorder people, you know, Addictions come in clusters, and for the eating disorder people, <clears throat> for the where where it's a an anorexic that is uh, severe and that underweight, and they begin to uh, get into recovery. That's when you got to really uh, work with them when you do that refeeding, because they can come in sweet, precious, and darling, weighing seventy pounds, but when they start regaining, refeeding, and regaining that weight, they become the most angry people in the world. And what I say is everybody stay, take cover. The, sta the staff needs to take cover because those anorexics, they may look frail. There's nothing frail about an anorexic. I mean, there can be the most powerful. I've only been beat up twice in all the time I've been in this business. And it's both times have been by 70, 75 pound anorexics. Thank God they didn't get me at the same time. I probably wouldn't be here. I mean, they bit me, they hit me. I had to go get a tetanus shot from all the bites. That's the anger from an anorexic that has been in there all the, those years of whatever has happened. <clears throat> and they found that if they started starving themselves, uh, I've never heard one yet that didn't say they started out feeling fat, either from their own perception or someone else told them that they were fat, or maybe they were overweight and they got tired of it and they started, they found a plant and they started <clears throat> not eating and the more compliments they got, the more they cut that food down. Whatever the reason, they get to us in different stages, in different backgrounds. Uh, but when an, an anorexic begins to recover, <clears throat> they must look at the rage and the anger. Uh, and uh, and then they, a lot of it is at toward themselves and they want to beat themselves up, uh, all that. But anyway, and then your bulimics. You know, a bulimic, majority of the time, and I'm not, do not take the, anyway, majority of the time, a bulimic can keep their weight down within a normal weight range, unless they are also doing the restricting too. <clears throat> but what a uh, 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 bulimic gets out of bulimia is getting rid of the rage. I mean, there it, that is the best way in the world to get rid of the anger and the rage. And it may not be on a conscious level, I'm a recovering bulimic. I can speak for not all of you, but I can speak as a uh, as a bulimic. I've had that emotional build up, build up, build up, build up. And then I was a volume eater. I would take in a lot of food, a lot of food, 
And then, you know, I was in OA and I was losing weight and the guilt of taking in all that food. And then I would practice bulimia and get rid of the food. And what I got addicted to was that sense of ease and comfort of getting rid of the food. It's like, <sighs> that's what the big book talks about that alcoholics get out of drinking, the sense of ease and comfort. That's whatever addict goes for. Ah, that sense of ease and comfort, but it doesn't last long because if you haven't dealt with the feelings and you haven't dealt with those underlying causes and conditions, we'll go back to our primary or we will go find something else to use. So with eating disorder, you know, that we treat a lot of obese people. Some are morbidly obese and some are on the spectrum. And what those of us who are, have been obese, we use food much like an alcoholic uses alcohol. It helps us feel better. It pushes down the feelings. It, it you know, it's just, it's soothing. Ah, oh, it gives us that sense of ease and comfort. So you get your reco get in recovery from an eating disorder. And I'm gonna address right now the uh, obese. And they lose weight and they begin to look good and they begin to get compliments. And oh my God, it feels good. And it, you feel, and those that don't go the other way and get into anorexia, they will get into within a normal weight range. And as they do that, they get so many compliments. And then I've seen this happen, not a lot, but I've seen it happen. Now I will say the divorce rate is about as high in recovery as it is in during the problem. Because I've seen obese people, they, a lot of times they settle in a marriage. They marry somebody, uh, maybe when they are overweight, uh, they settle because most men don't like fat women. So anyway, they're in a marriage that they really don't like the guy, but they've settled. And so when they lose the weight and get cute, precious, and darling, a little frisky, they will, I've seen, I've seen it over and over, they'll this, do this triplet, you know, where the eating disorder client, I mean, the obese person gets into recovery. And then, well, they need a whole new wardrobe. They'll get into debting and spending because they want to look cute. And then when they look cute, they get frisky and they may have them some single girlfriends and they'll start running around with those single girlfriends. A lot of them will go dancing. You know, the guy at home doesn't want to do that stuff. And I've seen it over and over. They will get into love and sex addiction. And when they get into the love and sex addiction, the guilt, the guilt comes up and that it, the danger of that is getting them back into their original addiction of using food to ease the pain of living. I'm not making this up. Um, there's some of you on here I can point you out, but I'm not going to. But I'll tell you, we've treated a lot of folks that this has happened to, and they've come back here, thank God. So a lot of, uh, uh, now this, uh, uh, most of, so many of your eating disorder people, particularly your compulsive overeaters, also suffer from codependency. That's the core issue under most addiction is the core issue and it is codependence set up in childhood. And then we act out the codependency in our adult life by being caretakers, caregivers, you know, trying to save the world, trying to rescue everyone, and we get something out of that. It's a feel good. So you will also see, uh, you know, a lot of our uh, compulsive overeaters come in with chronic codependency. And there, I mean, it'll just be even Stephen as far as their, uh, <clears throat> their diagnosis. But your alcoholics and drug addicts sometimes because the self-centeredness is greater, really, I think, in alcoholics and drug addicts. But in sobriety, that self-centeredness will show up in some ways through codependency. Uh, and a lot of times their guilt of not being there for people uh, if while they were in their addiction, they'll switch over and become caregivers, caretakers. Now, some of that is good, you know, 
but it's everything within a balance. But we have seen some drug addicts, alcoholics, get into trying to save the world. And when they can't, a lot of times they'll go back to their substance. And then I've mentioned this, but the love and sex addiction is a big deal in recovery across the board from any addiction. Uh, and, uh, you know, media addiction today is big. Uh, shopping and spending, I've already mentioned that. And then gambling. And so many of us, come, I mean, many of our our clients come with more than one addiction. They show up with one or more, and there'll be one that's the primary. Maybe they've done a little gambling, they've done a little this, they've done a little that. And if they're not careful in recovery, that that they've done a little bit in will become, whew, it'll come up the scale. So the solution is if you're thinking about switching off to a another substance or if you already have if you're into work addiction or gambling or your codependency or whatever it is what it all boils down to is you don't have a very strong program i hate to tell you that the program your recovery program has got to be stronger than any addiction that you get into it's got to be stronger and I would like to say you can just do a blanket coverage, you know, that you can just do the 12 steps, um, you know, one time and it covers all. It doesn't because I've seen really good recovering people switch over to another addiction. So if you're, uh, you know, lose that weight and you're cute, precious and darling and you get into uh, love and sex addiction and you get into some really, I've seen it can get into some really dark stuff, but you want recovery. Many of them have to go to recover uh, for treatment for specific for love and sex addiction. Uh, if not uh, treatment, they will need to go to a 12 step program and do the steps in that program or regard or, you know, or Al-Anon or codependency. Each one has to be addressed separately. You can't do a blanket coverage, uh, but I will tell you, any addiction is a killer. And when people switch addictions, and I, I'm sitting here telling you over and over, we've seen it happen. We've seen it happen. The dangerous part of switching an addiction and staying in it for any length of time as the guilt comes up, the remorse comes up, the memory comes up about the good days of early sobriety. And then when those feelings come up of, you know, resentment, somebody does us wrong, we get angry at them, we blow up. Now we're not only mad at them, we're mad at ourselves. That's self-resentment. And then we move into self-pity. And when an addict of any sorts gets into self-pity, the poor me's, poor me, pour me another drink or pour me another milkshake or whatever. It's when we get into the poor me's uh, that that's when we have to double up on our program because that is the dangerous sign that we're gonna find something to make us feel better. It's when we're in that feeling sorry for ourselves. Uh, you know, and I've been sick for two months. I can, I mean, I have gotten into a little bit of, well, bless my heart, how long is this going to last? <laughs> By the grace of God, I haven't had to practice an addiction, uh, and I haven't thought about it. But I, you know, just because we're in recovery, it doesn't uh, excuse, I mean, doesn't keep us from having bad days or bad hours or bad moments or some bad feelings. But this is where we have to stay surrounded about with people who are in recovery, who know us, who really can see the signs and symptoms and will love us through it and maybe even confront us. Uh, or if they see us, you know, into switching addiction, that they will love us enough to confront us or call our attention to it. So we don't take away one behavior Think about it. We don't take away one behavior without substituting it with another one. That's why the 12 step program has been as successful as it has. And you know, it's, uh, 
it is, I can't remember the word Amanda can. Uh, anyway, it is based on scientific uh, research that it does work. The 12 step programs work. I think the reason that they can't get as good of a, uh, of a recovery rate is because they don't have enough people to to really work with and you know as far as over the anyway as far as these studies go i think there's more recovering people in 12-step programs and i know there are than any other modality they can talk about all these new fancy treatment centers that are not doing the 12 steps you go look on their website that'll be the first thing we are non 12 step you're safe to come here and then they list all the things that they're going to do for you all those things that they do for you we do here but we also incorporate the 12 steps and a lot of other good treatment centers do because it works when nothing else works yes treatment centers do not need to do all 12 steps that's not all they they need to that should not be their whole program that is not uh, they, you know, treatment is treatment. You need to address all those underlying issues like we do. But we also want to reinforce that <clears throat> with a 12-step based program that you can live with the rest of your natural life. That will sustain your sobriety and your recovery. So not only a 12-step program, but uh, you know, it's about finding other things to do. When your whole life has been circled around your addiction, you're going to have to find something else to do. One of the things is uh, <clears throat> get out and find something positive to do. You know, there are so many good programs that, and I, f I try to find programs, and this is my belief, you do what you want to do. I try to find local programs to put my time, effort, and money in. I know that there's good in all programs, big, but I do know that there is billions of dollars going in to re Anyway, I'll stop that. I find something like, uh, you know, the house building, the things that you can do for, for mothers and children and addicts early in recovery or anyone, but find something local that you can get involved in, hands-on work, uh, where you can, there's a group of people here, carpenters, I noticed the other day, they are building these tiny houses to give addicts right fresh out of recovery a year, six months, a year, living in those tiny houses relieving that pain of having to find some place to live. I'm talking about people off the street here. Uh, so get involved in something like that, the hands-on work where you have that connection and that love of, of a, having a project and following it through to the end. Uh, and, you know, something in your own community. Uh, and then you might want to uh, for, further your, your education. There's people everywhere, particularly since the pandemic, that are going back to school. Go back to school. That will take up a lot of your time that you, sh that you used to spend uh, on an addiction. Uh, find a hobby. Mine is gardening. I can't do it right now. That's probably one of the reasons that I'm kind of depressed. I can't get outside in my garden. I'm not really depressed. I just feel sad that I can't get outside. But find a hobby. Something that you can do, that you enjoy doing, and that maybe you can do with other people. Uh, but whatever you do, <clears throat> learn to feel the feelings. I started with this. Feelings is the core of any addiction. Everyone has feelings. People, God made us with feelings. Those normies somehow know how to take a problem from a problem to a resolution. I don't know how they do it, but they do without using a substance in between. <clears throat> I do think there's a lot of active drinking in you know, a lot of cultures and a lot of businesses and all of that. But anyway, if you're not an alcoholic, I guess you can successfully drink. Uh, but the main thing is deal with the feelings as they come up. And if they are, if they linger, and if they are connected with old pain in the past, you can't deal with that by yourself, I don't think. 
So this is where come here and do a four day intensive. Go to your therapist, do some good work, some that in that inner work, get clear, you know, the big book says clear away the wreckage of the past. And it doesn't say you're going to get that cleared away in one for the fifth step. If it recurs, do some work, do some work around it. Uh, I believe talk therapy can be effective to get your story straight, you know, but when you stay with a therapist, you know, one or two hours a week for 10 years, and you're still trying to talk your way into recovery, maybe it will work for you. I don't believe in a lot of talk therapy. I think experiential therapy coupled with talk therapy to get those feelings up out of the body and out into <laughs> wherever it goes. So that's what I have on switching addictions. And any addiction is a killer, but the danger part of an addict of any sort getting back into an addiction is that it will, the dominoes will fall and it'll take you back to your primary. So these that I have here on the screen that I'm talking to, really all of you I think know this, uh, but if you don't, uh, maybe you heard something that you needed to hear. So I'd like to hear from some of you that have, uh, have more than one addiction and maybe had some good recovery and then relapse because you switched addictions or maybe switched addictions and didn't relapse, uh, but that you got help in the new addiction. So addictions are addictions and it, taken to the extreme, they're all colors. All right, so who would like to share? Who would like to start?